time here on CB3. It's always a pleasure. Well, we've um, the campaign season is um, is heating up. Yeah. Um, people are declaring That's what they right. want to do. Yeah. Um, we are yet to get your manifesto, but we know that very soon we'll be getting it. But um, I want to find out from you: what does a papal presidency mean for Ghana people? Well, I think uh, basically a presidency of Red Papu, with the, of course, very active support of a, a functional executive council, means a revival of Ghana football, I will say. Definitely, the reason why I'm saying that is that uh, we have a brand which has been uh, reducing value, a brand uh, which has been plagued with an identity crisis or an image problem. Not many people want to be associated with the brand. And even for those of us you describe as football people, there are times when you go into certain uh, events also and uh, when, the, when the introduction is rolled out and uh, the football aspect is mentioned, you don't know whether you should be proud or not. You know, so definitely it's about time uh, we make good use of the second life the FA has been given as per the new status that we've accepted. And then uh, move on to make sure we get Ghana football back on the track where it has to be because uh, Ghana football is, football is a game of passion. It's a point of convergence for social cohesion. It's something that takes our minds off the hardships and the, the pains on the ground. And uh, it's a way of promoting good health and all those kind of things, you know. There are quite a lot of values uh, that football brings on the table. A lot of these we've lost in the past years. And uh, I believe Fred Papo's uh, uh, presidency under Fred Papo will be a very sure way of bringing these things back on the, on the table. You've been talking about restoring the game. How do you plan to restore it? A regime of Red Papu will be inspired or as it were guided by a strategic document or a vision document that will be put in place. Elements of that will be in my manifesto. But if we are talking about a document that will be accepted and bought in by all stakeholders, then definitely it has to be a strategic document or a planning document, maybe over a medium term, five year plan or so, a revival plan of five years. That will be inspired by Fred Papu, but collectively prepared with the ideas and inputs of the entire executive council, the 12 member executive council. That's why I cannot say I'm bringing a strategic plan now. That will be a bit of an imposition. But what are the thematic areas of interest that your presidency will focus on? You were asking a very interesting question. We start from the top. That's the governance of football. How are we going to govern football? One major step has been made already with the promulgation of the adopted statutes. So that's a significant step. Quite a lot of uh, clauses and requirements in there will set us on the good chance to make sure we, are, we practice accountable governance. Issues relating to auditing, publication of audit statements, uh, appointments, recruitments, even things relating to procurement and accounting, so many things. There are a lot of things in there that one would have to follow quite clearly on the governance side. Now, uh, another aspect is that let's look at our game itself, coming to the game itself. We would have to look at football in Ghana, or in fact football in everywhere, as a pyramid. There's a base structure. Unfortunately, we've tended over the years to neglect the base structure and then concentrate on the little tip of the cone. You see, when a funnel, you know, that little long tip. We concentrate a lot on the Black Stars. We've literally killed juvenile football or coast football, with the exception of a few academies that are running around for many different motives and the rest, not even properly regulated. So it becomes a, a den or an avenue for unscrupulous people if they choose to come in to go in and then engage in some modern form of uh, slavery by picking the players and uh, taking them out en masse. So we have to look at the academies and then put in proper regulations over there with the participation of the academy uh, entrepreneurs themselves. Then you look at coast football. Coast football and academies I don't think are competitive. I think they can run side by side. There are way too many players out there to say it should only be academies. We play coast football. How do we, organize it? How do we reorganize the coast football? We we'll start from the RFEs through the district football associations to even unit football associations, so that in communities we promote uh, coast football, juvenile football in their communities. That way, you create a certain association between football and the community. Now, in so doing, too, you are solving the generational problem because children coming out of this uh, stream or this flow or this uh, chain 
would in three, four, five years start growing up to go to the starless, to go to the uh, satellites. Very exceptional ones can even find their way into the Black Stars. I bet the Pele played uh, uh, for the Black Stars when he was, he was almost about 16 years old. You know, so if we go back to this way, that way you are bringing football to the communities. And when these players start progressing to the level of uh, joining the Division 1 class, the Division 2 class, the Premier class and things like that, you will see their kinsfolk, their, their community members will be following them and following their matches. I was just telling the station just recently, when we were growing up, there were players like uh, Nimbe Pula, Bede Pele, then called Don Pele, Abu Moro, Henry Akwa and the rest, Olabode, who were playing calls. Then later they got recruited by the RTUs, the Secondary Hazakers, the Great Olympics and the rest. What did we do? We just followed them anytime time we were going to play. Uh, uh, let me just personalize it. Accra Great Olympics went for six under 14 players from the national under 14 camp and registered them. They got in their trams, their Danquis, Aziz and Sense, Oseb Watins, Laie Kinsins and the rest. Any time Olympics was playing, you were assured of the crowd from Jamestown, Manprobi, Kolegono, Kaole and the rest at the stadium. Other players were also coming from Teshi, Tema and other places, you know, if you go to Kumasi, it's the same. You go to the Western region, it's the same. You go to the Northern region, it's the same, you know. So if you start doing that, then that way you are solving the problems of uh, having the regular chain of supply of good players coming up. You are reviving interest in football through the, 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 the juvenile level and then bringing it up. Now, what do we do? You cannot assume that once players are being produced at the lower level, at the base level, they will necessarily get into the senior national team. We should make provisions for those who fall by the side. It's something we would have to look at. And then also, we should be looking very closely at collapse into the various national teams. We all know uh, how we receive allegations here and there about unfair collapse, call players being dropped left, right and centre because they do not have powerful people behind them to try to influence, I'm not saying it, but it's, how, these are, how true is that? It's true. It's true. I don't need to mention them. It's true. We've been in football and I dare anybody to come up and challenge me. It's true. I can mention a thousand and one examples. It's something we have to look at. Very well. Said that the poor player who has been given the talent by his God, is not everybody who can be a medical doctor or a lawyer or a journalist like you. You know, so maybe God has given that boy or girl the talent to be a very good footballer. And in so doing, to be the breadwinner for his family and even his community. And then somebody decides to stifle the player's growth through the system, simply because he doesn't have anybody behind him. Those things, we have to keep our eyes wide open on that. And uh, if, you, if you institutionalize that, and the people take you serious, they know you for who you are, that uh, look, if I say this, I mean this. If you are dropping the player, you are dropping player A for player B, no problem, you have that right to do that. But come and explain to us why you are doing that. And maybe we'll also tell you why you are wrong. So when people realize, coaches realize that you cannot do those kind of things just, just because you feel like doing so, they'll, 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 they'll be straight. And that way you have a lot of fairness in there. So there'll be fairness in call-ups moving up the chain. You know? So definitely that's, that's also one area we'll be looking at. If you're looking at domestic football, our leagues, the domestic league, the Premier Leagues, Started with a lot of very unpleasant things, hooliganism, bias officiating, poor attendance, all they are all interrelated, no sponsorship and the rest. It's it's all because we've destroyed the brand. Hooliganism, how do we stem? We have a lot of laws. Ghana, not just in football, but Ghana is one country where we have the most laws. We we ratify any international convention immediately it comes up, even before other nations start reading it. We have a lot of laws in our rule books. But then we do not implement them fairly. So you find a team misbehaving, you find a referee persistently being uh, reported for acts of corruption. We don't pay attention to it. If a referee is consistently performing below par, is persistently controversial, you should be able to look and zero in at the, uh, the history of the referee's matches, like they do in CAF and FIFA. And if you are convinced that this man is doing this, you just, you just take him off the folk, you know. So you must introduce transparency and fairness and discipline within the system. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a many pronged uh, approach that uh, if we say we are talking about yeah. them now, I don't think we'll finish. <laughs> it will be like I'm campaigning to get your vote. <laughs> anyway, but one, one interesting thing that you said, which I think is, it also dominates conversation a lot, the selecting of players. Exactly. And um, you've been there before. Yes. So you've spoken about it and everything, but what did you do at the time? to stop this? I'm proud to say in our time 
at least uh, as at least up until the time that I left the executive committee, it wasn't that prevalent. Because what we did was that, you remember uh, 2006 when we were going to the World Cup, Coach Doya, he had to come and present the, the squad to the public at the uh, teacher's hall or so, somewhere around the regional administration, whatever it is. He did that to us first, as an executive committee and as a management committee. He had to defend every single player he was calling and every single player he was dropping for us to be satisfied before we did that. A lot of other, I remember when uh, Celestete was taking the under 20 to the World Cup in 2009, he, we subjected him to the same kind of thing. And after every tournament, you had to come back and give us a report of what happened, why you excelled, why you didn't excel, what were the issues, what the, and we, we engaged in a very healthy discussion with them. So, at any point in time, the coaches had it at the back of their minds that, look, if I go, whatever happens, I'll have to come and answer. And the, 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 the quizzing and the scrutiny will not be a casual one. The FA looks a bit polarized with um, some sharp divisions. How do you intend bringing everyone on board after the elections? Uh, one thing I can say for myself is that uh, I must admit, with the exception of, uh, I think just one candidate whose name has come up, I am literally on very, very extremely cordial terms with each and every single one of the, the candidates. They, they relate to me so well and uh, we share jokes, we tease ourselves regularly, you know, so even, even, even if these factions you are talking about yeah. have been created or will be created as a result of the elections, it shouldn't be a difficulty for me to, 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 uh, to bring them on board. And then also, one other thing that uh, maybe I forgot to mention is that if, if I do get the note, I'll run an all-inclusive government in the sense that almost everybody will have a part to play in it. Even if it's just by a telephone call to suggest this and this, you'll have a part to play in it. Because the reason being that, look at all these uh, formidable persons willing to contest to become presidents, if to, to become president of the association. If everything goes through, it's only one person who is going to win. If it happens to be Fred Papo, one thing I can assure is that none of these, anybody who doesn't win, none of those who do not win or who fail to win, would be left to go away from football. Ghana football has suffered a lot from that. And I believe this is about the time we try, we try as much as possible to unite and then close our ranks before and after elections. If we are able to, before the elections, close our ranks better. If we are not able to, even after the elections, these guys will all come back. We will be encouraged to stay around, play different roles, depending upon their competencies. And if, Ghana you, if you're maybe your opponent or other opponent to win and they ask you to come on board to help Ghana football, are you willing to do that? It's Ghana football that we're all thinking of. But I know it will not come to that. I know Fepa will win. But it's Ghana football that we're all interested in. So definitely, whatever you have to offer, we should be doing it. There is a seeming um, distract for those who worked in the Nyantechi era. You happen to be one of those in that administration. And how do you intend to convince people, especially on the card of integrity? On the card of integrity, that's quite interesting. Uh, I would say the administration was in office for almost close to 13 years, right? It was during that period that Ghana qualified for the first World Cup, went there and excelled. It qualified for a second consecutive World Cup, went there and, and excelled over and beyond the previous one, where we went to Brazil, things didn't work so well. It was during that period that we won the Under-20 World Cup. The national uh, women's team won several laurels. The Under-17 girls, the uh, Under-20 ladies and the rest, they all did quite a lot. It was during that period that we got quite a lot of sponsorship. So the fact still remains that during that 13 year period, there were very, 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 very good and rosy and glorious times. You know, so it will be a bit flowing or preposterous to say that everybody associated with that 13 year regime should have nothing to do with football. The flip side of it is that if you are charting a new course, you still need some experience, significant experience on how to do it, how to go about the trade in order to succeed. So definitely that statement, I don't think has a very solid basis. The more importantly, everybody has a name. I think there's a local uh, problem like that. <laughs> so if a uh, purple says he wants to contest, uh, let's say Mr. Kuju 
Asamoah also wants to contest. Julia Bewa also wants to contest. You know all of us. And you know we went during this period. At different points in time, we were in the period. Everybody knew what we did or what we didn't do. So if you have an issue with somebody, be specific and then point out that, look, Mr. So so and so, Mr. So and so, I think during the time when you were there, we did this and this and this. I do not think you should be part of the process going forward. Then that way we'll be moving closer towards getting a better solution. But to throw away the baby with the dirty water, we'll be, we'll be pressing the self-destruct button. And also beyond the Nyantechi tag, um, people generally have developed some distrust for football people as they put it um, these days. How are you going to deal with that? People, they are right. It's a, it's a brand. It has to do with the brand. I have the, my favorite topic. I think I've not had a chance to talk much about it. It's a brand. The brand has been battered. The brand has been uh, dismembered. The brand has been dirtied. You know, so definitely people want, who are, would, would naturally associate everybody with the brand in a certain way which is not so positive. So we would have to do a lot by way of accountable practices, by way of transparency, by way of uh, getting to the people in humility, and then by way of assuring them that uh, you are engaging in governance practices that are modern, that will encourage or engender confidence in individuals and then corporate Ghana and then even international multinationals to come on board the association. And to enable, uh, to enable you to do that, you must put in place certain practices publish audited accounts, credible audited accounts, have regular interaction with the media, uh, engage in open sessions. There are so many things you can do. But the fact, the most important thing is that we do recognize, and I do recognize, that our brand has been battered. And the, 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 the disquiet, or the, as it were, the, 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 the lukewarm attitude, or the unfavorable poster that we enjoy from the public, or we suffer from, or we endure from the public, it's justifiable. We have to sit down and then work at it to revive ourselves. And I, I, I believe that is doable under a fair proper administration. Can the people of Ghana trust you? I think so. Uh, I, I wouldn't be, I don't think I'm the best person to talk about what I've done or what I've stood for in terms of uh, my principles, in terms of discipline, hard work, integrity, humility, uh, unifying people or unifying blocks. Uh, surviving and handling, uh, multitasking, working under pressure, so many things. Guyanese out there know Fred Papo and they know if it comes to doing this job, he's about the right person for the job. Will your administration be um, accountable and transparent for the Ghana people? Interestingly, I would have said, uh, I would have said a simple yes and uh, gone scot free if I wasn't going to do that. But the fact of the matter is that it's embedded right at the heart of the statutes and regulations accountability we would have to do uh, recruit international audit consult uh, consultants not that i don't trust the ghana audit i do trust them they are doing very splendid work but it's a fifa requirement that we should go for international audit firms and publish the accounts in the national the audited accounts in the national dailies i know previously we were even sending it to the public accounts committee we will we'll do all these things those are minimum requirements but we would even go the, the the extra length in that way so definitely transparency and uh, accountability is no, once again non-negotiable and they, 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 they coincide with the principles that I believe in. So I'm definitely for sure we will have to do that because if we are talking about restoring the confidence that Ghanaians have lost in, in, in the GFA, you don't restore the confidence by hiding your accounts. It's getting to the elections and you've been doing a lot of discussions. When you speak to delegates, are you getting the sense that um they have the belief in you and um, they I are do. ready to give you the nod? I do. It's very humbling. It's very humbling, but I'm not going to rest on my oars. I'm not going to be complacent. Uh, the interesting thing is that they are quiet, but I believe it's a delegate who knows what is in the set. It's all right, you know. If you go out there, if I go out there and I'm, I'm, I'm pre preaching my messages, it doesn't take long for them to understand what I'm saying. So it's, it's, it's going well, I'll say, but there's still a lot of hard work to be done. I would have to go out to the nooks and crannies of the country and then uh, do as much as possible. I want to target a uh, face to face with each and every single one of the 120 where possible. Where not possible, definitely a telephone contact or a contact through an intermediary will be done and it's been done all over the place. Thanks so much for the opportunity to once again uh, get over to the Ghanaian people and to the delegates. I, I'm offering myself on this crusade. This, uh, I take it as a, a crusade and a sacrifice to offer my qualities, my experience, 
my beliefs and then my time and my, all my, my resources to lead this very important process that we want to embark on. I cannot sit back with all the experience and things I've gained in football whilst I leave my colleagues to go and battle with this uh, restoration campaign. So I'm offering myself and I believe looking at my qualities and the people around and the system and where we want to get to, I think the best person for the job will be Fred Papo. So I entreat uh, the delegates as they consider. They should just feel free, get to me, find out more about me, ask whatever questions from me. And then uh, at the end of the day, I'm sure when they go in, they will make the right choices. That will be Fred Papo. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you so much. For My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you.